Okay, this is Mike Davis <laughs> with Lovecraft Ezine. Um, today is, I know it ends in a Y. Uh, today is March 31st, 2013, and today, we're going to be, your, Joe, your mic is doing that again. Jesus H. <laughs> yeah, the right day. Oh, yeah, nice. you got the right day. Uh, today we're going to be talking with Jim Bentley. He's with Black Bag, Black Bag Pictures, and they're putting out a film, short film called Miskatonic University. Um, and who's that with you, Jim? Um, I'll introduce them, and maybe they can add a little bit. This is Perry O'Brien here. Hello. And David Donnelly. Howdy. Hi there. Um, and. This is Willem Pugmire, so you guys know who you're talking to. He's a writer in Seattle. Rick Lay. Damn it, Rick Lay. I don't ever no, it's remember. Lay. It's Lay. You got Lay. it right. I got it right the first time. Yeah. Okay. Also a writer. I don't know who that is. Um, wait. Yeah. Pete Rollick. He's got a book coming up called Reanimators. Soon, soon to be an HBO miniseries. <laughs> That's my dream. Yeah. Joe Pulver, he's a writer. Uh, he lives in Berlin. And Dominique, a uh, token female here, so that we don't get sued. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Daniel, I don't know how to say your last name. It's your first time here, I think. Thank you. Uh, but, but, but it's it's OK. I'm a writer, and uh, but I um, published in German. Awesome. And uh, edit, I think for the next month. So, do you guys, uh, uh, Joe? You saw this. Uh, you saw that video of theirs. That looks pretty cool, huh? Oh, well, that's right. Joe can't talk right now. Screw that! I'll talk if I want to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been hey, okay, so uh, guys, um, tell us a little bit about Miskatonic University. You know when it's coming out, and what a little bit about the plot, or anything you want to tell us about the movie. Sure. So it's a it's a short film. Um, it's actually a pitch project because we'd like it to become a television series. Oh, okay. Um, we're going to pitch the uh, the film hopefully. After we're going to premiere first at Necronomicon uh, in Providence, Rhode Island, in August. Yeah, well, most of us will be there too. Great. That's yeah. we're we're really excited about that. I was thrilled when I found out that they wanted to take the film, um, especially since we sent them basically a trailer. Uh, so they're 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 taking a little bit on blind faith, but it's it's very exciting for us to be able to uh, premiere it uh, at. At a convention like that, where all the fans will be there, um, um, it just seems a, an appropriate venue. Um, Neil's a no, very, no. very nice guy. So yeah, and there's going to be a lot of people there. So. Um, the the film itself is going to run about a half an hour, um, and it's the story about a professor uh, named Thomas Highland, who's a World War One veteran, who. Uh, comes to Miskatonic University uh, to take a new job um, as a professor, and he's carrying with him this sort of dark curse um, that involves his dreams um, and sort of a mysterious past. Um, and it's really a launching point uh, for hopefully uh, several other storylines and arcs that uh, we would like to uh, have be developed into a series. Well, it. Obviously, it sounds Lovecraft, uh, Lovecraftian, but not based on a specific Lovecraft story. Is that is that correct? Um, yes, I, I, that that is correct. I think we're, it's it's heavily influenced by several of the stories. Um, yeah. You know, most notably, Shadow Out of Time, um, I, maybe a little bit of Shadow Over In's Mouth as well. I don't know. Do you guys want to add to that a little bit? Um, yeah. Um, uh, because of the uh, because uh, the, the sorry uh, because of the dream aspect um, actually uh, one of my favorite uh, stories by um, uh, Lovecraft maybe you can help me with the, with the pronunciation of the name is Celeface or Celeface um, mm -hmm. uh, about a person who basically uh, uh, continuously goes into uh, more and more dream realms. Um, oh, it was a big influence for me. It's one of my, it's one of his shorter stories, but 
I've always loved that story, and so um, so a lot of our spitballing came from basically throwing out different uh, stories uh, that really influenced us. And for me, that was that was one of the bigger ones. I'd also say that maybe the Nameless City gets a shout out for certain. Um, so there's a there's a lot in there. Um, I think the idea was to pull from everything and sort of tell our own stories, create our own characters, create our own plot lines, but to pull from Lovecraft's rich mythos. Um, and not just the Cthulhu mythos, but also the Dream Cycle stuff, the Silver Key stuff. Um, we really were just trying to get it all in there. Um, because well, I, I was talking with Joe and I were talking actually a few weeks ago, Joe Porter was here, and we were talking about the fact that filmmakers um, – seem to over and over that they want to do um, Lovecraft stories. You know, they want to do, um, you know, another Pickman's model or a Call of Cthulhu. But, you know, we've all seen that over and over, and we were we were saying this is exactly what new filmmakers do, need to do, and Lovecraftian filmmakers anyway, is, is do Lovecraftian films, but 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 themed, you know, not based on a, on a specific Lovecraft story. So yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you guys are doing that. Um, yeah. Is there a is there a trailer on YouTube or something like that? Um, not yet. We 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 really feel like we uh, should finish the shooting. We've shot eighty percent of it, um, mm -hmm. but frankly, a majority of the of the 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 shock and awe, I guess I'll call it, or the money shots uh, have yet to be filmed. So even though mm -hmm. a, a majority of it has been filmed. All of the dream sequence stuff has not been filmed, and we're planning on shooting that in May. Um, so the trailer, I, I think we're holding off on a trailer till we really have something uh, that we can sort of entice fans with and, and, and really put the full film out. If, if I was to put a trailer out now, it would look like a somewhat sinister version of Downton Abbey. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Which, by the way, was our plan. If this doesn't pan out, we're just doing that sinister version of Downton Abbey. <laughs> uh, uh, assume anybody does not live happily ever after in the film, though. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so you you'll also have post production work. You doing any a little CGI? That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Uh, there's there's definitely going to be a monster in this one, um, but I, it's really not. In a way, it's not even the central element of the film. Um, this, we, I, frankly, the way I, I'm looking at this project, it's not a horror film in the strictest sense. I think a lot, it seems to me a lot of Lovecraft films end up being, falling within strictly a horror genre, and I think that, you know, Lovecraft reaches a lot more than just, just pigeonholing into a genre. And it's hard in film because in dramatic writing, I mean, you, you got to get it all out in a, kind of a short period of time, and, right. uh, so... I'd say that there's there's a little bit more going on here than just um, you know a monster <laughs> devouring people. Well, you know, it, it, we've said this over and over again too that um, that's not really what Lovecraft is about. It's not about monsters. It's about the you know m much of it, I should say, is about cosmic horror and such. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, we we agree with that for sure. I mean, I I would say that it, that's what I find the most compelling. Uh, yeah. Is it's, and it, that's a very hard thing, I think, to dramatize cosmic horror. Um, with insanity being the theme, uh, representing that visually is kind of tough. Yeah. Um, uh, another thing, uh, another aspect of um, another aspect of Lovecraft stories that we're really having a lot of fun with, though, is uh, the hubris of, of of man, specifically within like an academic realm, going after what is clearly marked as uh, knowledge that they are not meant to have. And so when we started writing this script, we wanted to study in Miskatonic University because we wanted to explore how that, how, how that can kind of come to be. In, 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 uh, in, in uh, stories such as like uh, Whisper in the Dark, you basically have a set academic who basically believes that everything that he, um, that he, that he discovers you should absolutely know regardless of the warnings. Um, we're, when, we, when we started uh, making the script, uh, we wanted to uh, we wanted to have this character specifically Highland, um, not immediately run, running with that kind of hubris. So that's one of the that's one of the aspects of uh, Lovecraft stories that we're really having a lot of a lot of fun. Right. With. Well, um, okay. Having said all of that, how would you guys? I mean, what is your definition of horror then? Good question. 
It's a great question. Jim? It's a great question. <laughs> uh, you want to answer that? Yeah, I mean, I, I can. So all of us are certainly, uh, and, and again, by the way, I'm, I'm, my name's Perry. I'm one of the uh, the writers of this script. And this was something we spent a lot of time talking about. Um, obviously, everybody who's on this this Google Hangout and is part of the e-zine, uh, there's something about Lovecraft that speaks to all of us and to generations and generations of uh, often very mainstream horror writers, folks like Stephen King and whatnot. But as David was saying, how you how you translate the stupendous psychological effects of the, this of the genre that you really invented, cosmic horror. How you translate that to screen in a way that doesn't just become absurd or ridiculous, silly. I mean, I, I think uh, uh, as as sort of as true enthusiasts for Lovecraft, I'm sure you guys feel the same way we do. That in some ways it's sad that the if people know Lovecraft, it's because like maybe one of their Friends had like a little stuffed tentacle toy or something, you know that like like yeah. Cthulhu, he's become this sort of cute running gag about tentacles or something, you know. And that and I, and I don't know about you guys, but that's not when I read Lovecraft. What's amazing, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's yeah. not. You know, I don't know what kind of pe- I don't know what kind of person would put that in a video, you know. <laughs> <laughs> People, and that's people who are desperate to get their film funded. Just, right? just <laughs> desperate people. Oh my God. Desperate. Yeah. But, but no, I, I, I'm kidding. Of course, you're absolutely right. And it, it's very hard. It's very easy to do wrong. You know? Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it is a source of humor. Oftentimes, I think it's almost like a private joke and a wink and a nod among uh, fans uh, because of because of how difficult it is to really wrap your head around it. Right. Yes. Or not. <laughs> or, not. <laughs> or have your head unraveled by it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, the thing that we struggled with is the, the physical manifestation of Lovecraft's horror elements are monsters, right? But the monster movie genre is so done and redone and parody. I, I mean, I'm sure some oh, folks yeah. thought, like, Cabin in the Woods, which I think to me was a pretty great example. Of, like, you know, w- once you have a film that is so meta and ridiculous – you know, a genre sort of run its course. So mm-hmm. the question is, would it be possible within the genre conventions of a monster film to represent anything, you know, one iota of what's, what I think what we think is significant and meaningful and impactful about Lovecraft? And I think it was our agreement that that wasn't the case. So in terms of the question of like what, what our definition of horror is, we started looking at other models and, and films that had a more sort of psychological horror that focused on you know the, the human consequences of, of encountering forbidden knowledge in the way that Dave talked about. But then, frankly, we ran into another roadblock, which is one of the things that people talk about Lovecraft, is he created an incredibly uh, you know, profound you know, mythology, but his human characters aren't particularly memorable, and there isn't much human interaction that goes on that really, really captures that. He, However, obviously, film is something that's driven in large part by drama, by interactions between humans. So that was something that we, you know, one of the reasons I think we felt like it was much more important to go with uh, something that was informed by Lovecraft and uh, in some ways, you know, uh, our own love letter to his work without being a strict adaptation of love stories. I like what you did there. uh, I totally agree. I mean, that's what what Lovecraft using is all about, the issues. It's not not people trying to mimic Lovecraft. It's people bringing uh, Lovecraftian themes to what they would what what they would write so yeah so yeah and a hundred year a hundred years later as writers as filmmakers as as artists if, if we're not character driven especially with what you're doing you're doing a visual project yeah I have no no time to spend on a film that doesn't bring me into the characters Mm-hmm. If, if I'm not interested in your character, I, I'm I, I'll change the channel. I'll right. stop the DVD. Yeah. Now, speaking of your character, seeing how you've used the trope of placing him at Miskatonic University, and he's a professor. What is he a professor of? He's come back from World War One, and he's harmed, and he's carrying some dark secret. But you also have him now as an academic. What, what's his academic background? Well, he's a he's a ling- uh, language expert. Um, you know, one of the things that we were really drawn to about Miskatonic University as a place um, is that oftentimes the stories they're not really set at the university. They have characters that maybe studied there or who have read some of the forbidden books there. Uh, but we really found that setting setting the story at the university itself 
opened up a lot of doors for us to sort of create a hub for several stories to shoot off. So it, you know, it, we can spoke off from the university, but as a place, it's, I mean, universities themselves are very compelling, weird uh, places to be in, where you have a hierarchy, you have students, and then you also have faculty, and then you have administration, and then there's town-gown relations. Um, so I think, uh, as just as a as a place to set a, a series, it seemed like a very attractive um, sort of setting. Um, and in terms of having him come in as a professor, uh, we really liked the idea of him being a professor as opposed to, say, a student or outside because we wanted him uh, to come. He's a seeker uh, who, who is really about investigating this, this mystery. Uh, so, you know, even though he's a veteran, this, this story takes place 10 years after the war, um, and he's come to without giving too much away, he's come to the university to to finally start unraveling some of these secrets that have, you know, been building up. Yeah, we also played with the idea of having him be a marine biologist, but we thought that was too obvious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you don't have to run the list. I'm, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? <laughs> you have to I, I couldn't hear you. Could you repeat I, that? I, I, I joked that, uh, I said that we, we I, our first idea was to have him be a, a marine biologist, but it was, you know, it was too soon. It was, it was too soon. <laughs> too soon. Wanted, yeah, yeah. You want a court to do uh, soft time. Um, what, um, you, you said, you told me a little bit of this an hour ago when we were doing our video test, but can you talk a little bit about how you guys came together and formed Black Bag Pictures, how that all started? Sure. Drunken Dare. <laughs> <laughs> Like all great projects, it's kind of true, actually. Uh, we 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 all came at it from different directions. We did all grow up together in Maine, actually, um, which is a very creepy place. Um, so Lovecraft is sort of viscerally rubbed off on us. Um, but the way that the film company started uh, was that a friend of ours, uh, you know, went through film school and got really good with the camera. Um, and he's sort of like our technical expert. He, I, I consider him like he's like a special forces guy. When I need him for a tactical mission, we send him in, and he gets really good footage. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, him and then myself, I moved to New York City uh, and did, uh, a lot of theater um, for many years and Shakespeare at classical theater um, and got more into directing. Um, and then, I don't know, these guys can speak for themselves if they want. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, yeah. Um, well, I've been a Lovecraft fan for the majority of my life. Um, uh, so, well, uh, beyond just being a Lovecraft fan, though, I've been a, a, a fan of uh, film for the majority of my life. Um, I'm a student right now and uh, working full time, so naturally, when my closest friends came to me and said, "We would like the rest of your free time, what little you have," I said, "Sure." Um, and so, uh, and so, I started helping them with uh, uh, with uh, with scripts. Um, and uh, when they gave me the option of uh, once we had scripts. I love doing punch-ups. I love it. I, I help friends who um, who have other projects, and when they ask me for script punch-ups, like nothing makes me happier than taking a story and actually like trying to make it more of what it can be. Um, and so that's pretty much why I'm still here. Um, <laughs> it's, it's like you know, um, is is pretty much because I love I love being part of the process. Yeah. So our, our first project was a, a, a post-apocalyptic romantic comedy. Um, and it was a, for lack of a better term, a clusterfuck. Uh, <laughs> which was also going to be the name of our uh, company, but we just got decided <laughs> against it. Uh, and then uh, we worked on a 48-hour film project, um, which I think was, we would argue was a success. Um, we won the Audience Choice Award for that. Um, and then we moved on uh, to do a yeah. uh, PSA, public service announcement, uh, an anti-smoking video for, um, with, that featured zombies. Um, and so now we're working on this. So really, we we specialize in doing narrative short films um, that have somewhat of a sci-fi dark twist to them. That's usually yeah. what, the type of work we do. You've uh, reached. Oh, and by the way, um, Pete and Willem and um, everybody, Rick, everybody else. You guys are uh, most. Of you guys are Lovecraft and writers. So please feel free to to ask some questions as well. But my next question is. Um, you reached your, uh, you just now reached your Kickstarter um, goal. What are your, you got about a day and a half, I think, left. 
on Kickstarter. What are your stretch goals? Um, if if we achieve with those. Well, uh, one thing that Kickstarter doesn't really advertise uh, directly, but I think some people are aware of this, not everyone is, is that they actually do take, obviously, a cut of what's pledged, mm -hmm. um, which ends up being about 10%. Um, and for anyone out there who wants to launch a Kickstarter, first of all, I'll say definitely do it. It's a great experience. Um, we've loved it, and I, I just think it's a wonderful tool for any artist or writer out there uh, which you guys all seem to be. So I highly recommend if you have something that you're working on that you need to boost it with some some support. Um, but I will say that Kickstarter does take about 10%. Um, so even though we asked for 7,500, it's really great that we have this last few days to really push it um, so that we can actually make what our budget is. Um, the other thing I'd say is with film, there's always cost overruns. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Like, you just yeah. have so little control over so much of what's happening, like, especially when you're shooting like on location. Storm? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so we're actually shooting at Jones Beach, which is um, you know on Long Island, but it turns out Paramount Pictures is shooting the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie in the exact location that I had put aside and worked with with the permitting <laughs> office. And all of a sudden, Paramount Pictures drove in with a hundred big 18-wheeler trucks and they built a giant studio right where, basically, where we were going to be doing our, our thing. We sent them a CC to say, we're waiting for them to get back to us. Uh, so, I you know, it's I just... I can't even believe they're filming that movie. Wow, jeez. Yeah, yeah. I know. So, Mike, Michael Bay managed to not just mess up Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but our film as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's done that to a lot of films, though. Yeah, <laughs> so we we did try to pitch them on the idea of like a of a uh, of a joint project where we would try to love craft uh, make a Lovecraftian film about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, they're also going to back us on that. They one. didn't jump on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it says something about doing lunch. I don't. I don't. Yeah, we're not going to hold our breath. When, uh, when do you, when so, do you, you know, have the film finished and out for people to watch and so forth? Uh, can you say, say that again? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I said, when do you guys um, hope to have the film finished and available for people to watch? I, I think, realistically, it seems like this August um, Necronomicon premiere is probably going to be the, the best sort of launching time. So we'll, right. do, a, we'll do a screening there, and then we'll uh, send out. We, we offer it as a reward, a digital download of the film. Uh, so we'll send that out probably a day after, two days after we do the, the Necronomicon Festival. That, that's our target goal. Um, so that's when people will get to, get to see it. Yeah, this is one more thing to look forward to at Necronomicon. That's going to be that's gonna be a really fun time. Yeah, we are super psyched about it. Yeah, I saw that Mike Mignola gave um, some, some art to the Bronze Bus Project. Um, how'd they work that out? That's pretty cool. Mike Mignola? Yeah. Really? Yeah, they, they announced it on... I saw it... The other there was day. an email sent out to a lot of us to contribute to, you know, perhaps a signed book or signed piece of art or whatever, and McNola's a fan, so that's what he uh, donated. Awesome. Hmm. Cool. Yeah, um... The, today's pretty noteworthy too, because 15 minutes or so have gone by, and I haven't heard Pete Rollick say a word. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking that it's starting to freak me out. I just yeah. assumed he was hung over again. I am hung over. <laughs> <laughs> so hung over, he apparently isn't drinking. I, that's a pretty safe assumption that he's hung over. I, I have my oh. mic on. I have my mic on mute because the dude's mowing his lawn next door, and it's really loud. Mm. So. Did you explain to him that the Lovecraft Easing show is on? Uh, they look at me when I'm like this, and they <laughs> they don't take me seriously. <laughs> uh, I dress I dress like this, and people still don't take me seriously. <laughs> well, I, we, I thought uh, you were going to be in, in persona, is, is dressed like that. But no, I'm just I'm just in my Easter best. Oh, your Easter best. Which is your persona, right? <laughs> oh, I, I think Lehman's wife was a priest. He has to behave on Easter Sunday. That's right? that's very true. <laughs> um, 
I posted um, a link. If you're watching this, anyone watching this um, at the website, there's a link to to pledge if you feel like doing so. Is there anything else you guys want to talk about the film? Um, anything at all, or questions that I don't know to ask? I'm I don't I don't pretend to be an expert on films, of course. So. If you want to clap, clap. Sorry, I keep forgetting. So something is something is wrong. I can't see anything. I can hear you, but I but, but I can't see anything. You can't see it. Mm -hmm. Daniel, do you do reviews on YouTube? What? Do you do book reviews on yeah. on yeah, video? That's me. Yeah. That's how I recognize you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very yeah. nice. Thank you very much. Everything everything is white. Uh, well, you might have to restart your computer. That usually fixes everything. Uh oh. Um, I would I would definitely say though, um, if you wanted to donate. Um, one of the things we don't advertise on the website is that we, we, we launched into this project um, as writers, uh, creators, and uh, Lovecraft fans. And if for nothing else, please reward us for still being Lovecraft. Uh, we have had some of the most monumental discussions about Lovecraft mm -hmm. as fans and like creating this, uh, creating this thing has been uh, extremely, extremely rewarding. Um, but uh, it's, it's, uh, been a, it's been a real labor of love, a lot of our... Our cast and crew is amazing, though. Um, the people that we've got working on this thing is, is absolutely amazing. I can I think Jim can speak a little bit more about like what it's like on the ground, though. Um, for if you want to, if you want to. I mean, I just say that. I mean, you guys as writers and anyone as a independent anything artist, uh, you know, we're not backed by a studio. Obviously, I mean, we're doing this through Kickstarter and through our own funds. So. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's uh, it's been an amazing experience, and uh, I, I'd say I we really appreciate coming on here and being uh, with you guys tonight. Uh, this this makes me this is a big deal for us. We're as fans, I think uh, it's really exciting to come before you guys and really and be able to talk about the project. Well, the the thing is that there's you know there's just there's there's some good ones, but there's just not enough. Uh, good Lovecraftian films out there. You know, as I often say, the big studios get it wrong, yeah. and a lot of times the little little guys, um, you know, so to speak, get it right because um, they understand what Lovecraft is really about. It's not about tentacles or monsters, and so, you know, that's why I wanted to have you guys on. That's why I wanted to mention you guys uh, because we want to see films like this. Um, you know, get create, get done. We we need more films like this. We need more what's films, exciting, as I said. Yeah. Any, go ahead, Wallen. I'm sorry. Is, what's exciting about this is that you guys are authentic Lovecraftian. Yeah. And and that's kind of you know if you've seen the movies from the Lovecraft Historical Society mm -hmm. or listened to their radio dramas, you can tell that these guys are just really totally into Lovecraft, they understand Lovecraft, and they appreciate Lovecraft. And that's the vibe I'm getting from you guys. You are true Lovecraftians. And so that, to me, that heightens my level of excitement for your movie. Yeah, I'd say those, those guys you mentioned, I think are, I think honestly, have done the best work of anyone ever in, for film. I think yeah. that that, sil that silent film of Call of Cthulhu, I mean, yeah, it's a silent film, uh, it's really good. But it's really good. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, if anything, to give those guys credit, they're probably doing something that's even more for the fans than what we're doing, only because I, the only reason why I say that is be, because we are, we're pulling from Lovecraft's mythos, but we are writing our own story, so I, it's, they're not strict adaptations. So I think we're, we're going to, you know, we are. But, you know, Jim, really, I, I really think, though, that it's time to be. Uh, and as I said, Joe and I have discussed this several times before. That it really is time for um, small filmmakers, or what it, you know, it'd be nice if large filmmakers did it too. But to to start doing Lovecraft themed movies too. I mean, we we know the stories, and um, we it's nice to go into a Lovecraftian movie not knowing what's going to happen because you yeah, haven't read the story. Yeah. Oh, and that's one of the beauties of AM 1200, and that's yeah. why we need people stretching out and developing their own work. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, how often have I discussed AM 1200? And that's an approach that these guys are 
are doing at this point. You know, they're taking their own material. It's like, yeah, we have a basis, you know, we have the stage, we're using some of the background material, but just as they're they're just adapting it. You know, we're they're, they're, it's not a straight one to one conversion, you know, and which we're all sick of. We've all seen all seven Pikmin's models. We we don't get <laughs> another Pikmin. You know. Now that's a question as you guys as Small independent filmmakers and as as Lovecraftians have have you guys looked at a lot of the smaller Lovecraftian projects to see what's been done to look yeah, at question. what's good about them to, to look at mistakes. Um, yeah, uh, I mean the first film that comes to mind is the one that came out in the the nineties. So Dagon, uh, that one, Dagon? Necronomicon. Oh, Necronomicon. Yeah, it's like four. It's like four smaller stories. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, and that's interesting. Uh, I've looked. That one immediately pops uh, to mind though because um, it's kind of like it, it, it charges head on with the idea that uh, Lovecraft described these creatures that are supposed to be indescribable. Um, and they, they said, like, we're going to still make monsters in a monster movie with Lovecraft. Um, uh, so I've, I've looked at that one. I've looked at some smaller ones on uh, Netflix. I can't remember any of yeah, them. Some, some that you guys might want to check out, and then, you know, maybe stop me if you have seen them. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe mentioned AM 1200. That one's, uh, I can give you a link to that one if you, but it's very, very well done. Um, another one that's free to watch right now on Netflix is a film called Absentia. Um, and I'm, I'm mentioning films that are like your film, Lovecraftian themed, not based on specific Lovecraft stories. Right, but again, like theirs, we're, 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 discuss we're dealing with character-driven pieces that yeah. just use Lovecraftian material as accoutrement, which is what's vital here. W without being character-centered, why bother? Although yeah. Necronomicon has the distinction of having out Howard Phillips Lovecraft fighting Cthulhu with a sword. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, some people really diss on that movie, but I just think it's one. It's like it's like a B movie that you love to watch. I mean, right. I, I like that for that reason. My my goal is to supplant Jeffrey Combs as the face of Lovecraft. <laughs> <laughs> you've already reached it, I think. Uh, sorry, you, yeah, you've really already you've Cox already, Cox already done it. that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hey, I, well, hey, Joe. Yeah. Joe, I love it when you speak French. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're a wacko. Hey, hey. I'll, I'll see you in thirty days, brother. Are you Bring really? Bring me a hat. Oh I, my! I'm not bringing my hat, honey. Yeah. It, uh, well, um, the film festival paid for me and Joe to go in May, so. What? Yeah. Oh whoa. So yeah, yeah, you're not the, you're not the only ass going to be parked on that bench, my brother. <laughs> I'm going to be on that bench a lot because I cannot walk. I went yeah, to a convention yesterday, and it was uh, it was not good. I'm a cripple. Well, I spent a lot of time on the bench too. So okay, the, well, the real good. reason why I had you on the show is that you assured me there would be. A lot of nudity. Are you telling me now that that's not true? <laughs> uh, well, look at the time. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, it, maybe in, in the film right now, uh, it's still pretty cold in Brooklyn. Uh, yeah. You know, w one thing I did want to say, though, that we... Uh, uh, yeah, tell them it's cold. Thanks, man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the one thing that I'm, we forgot to mention, um, we're, we, we, we grappled with... Um, whether or not we wanted to do a period piece, yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I think this is important to point out. Uh, I we debated back and forth, and finally we said no, we have to do this as a period piece. And I think the reason why is there's something very compelling about, particularly that interwar period, um, as a setting for Lovecraft. Um, I think he's very much a product of his time. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, the, the, obviously, the problem that then we were faced with is shooting something set in, a, in the, specifically, in our case, in 1929, is it's way harder to do. Yeah, there's a lot of money right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we had to rent vintage costumes and really think about if we're doing location oh shooting, we had to really think about where we were shooting, how we were setting it up. Um, you know, vehicles obviously become an issue. Uh, so you know, that that was a real challenge as filmmakers logistically. Um, but we we feel strongly that 
two things really that the period w was very important to portray as as within Lovecraft's time, mm -hmm. um, and also the setting. Uh, we shot um, a big chunk of it in Maine um, uh, because we think that New England has a very particular look feel that um, that Lovecraft, uh, you know, obviously was very much enamored. With. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. I know, that, uh, you know, that I think those were two things that we that we thought you know a, a lot about and decided that we had we couldn't compromise on those two things. You know, the other thing about that too is um, the forbidden knowledge uh, you know that you mentioned and everything and. You know, it, I, I think films like Absentia and AM1200, they can be set in contemporary times and do a very, very good job. However, you know, back then, you couldn't just look something up on the Internet. And, and right, yeah. You, right. If you got in trouble, you couldn't call someone on your cell phone, um, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, we, we were joking when we were uh, debating whether or not this should be a period piece. It would be like, okay, well, if we make it in the 21st century, what's the first thing we have to do? And, like, Perry was like, we have to get rid of the main character's cell phone. And like every time, every time something happens, oh no, my phone, damn T-Mobile. Like we just, we decided that it would just be, it would be more true to what we wanted to do to put it in the, uh, in the early 20th century. Um, and, and, uh, and shockingly, uh, in, a, in a logistic sense, it was easier for us to, to figure out how to get appropriate costumes and cars than it was in a narrative sense to um, stop the main character from looking up like Necronomicon.org and just Googling forbidden right. knowledge. <laughs> what, what year again is it set in? 1929. Um, Pete, your book, what year is Reanimator set in again? I don't 1905 to 1930. Yeah. So... Um, yeah, Pete, I'm sure you'd have, you have something to say on the time period as well. I, I mean, it lends to it, definitely. Well, it, it's funny because what they were just talking about is when Dennis Lehane was writing Shutter Island, mm -hmm. it was originally a contemporary piece. Mm -hmm. And every time he went to a certain scene, he said, this entire movie ends because all this confusion can be solved with a cell phone call. Right, yeah. right, exactly. So, Ultimately, he had to set it backwards in time and make it a period piece just so that you could move the story forward. Yeah. And there, are, there are certain things that we, we, can't, we can't disbelieve anymore. I'm tired of seeing this trope that my cell phone doesn't work. The car won't or, start. Or my tricorder is being interfered with ionic atmosphere. <laughs> yeah. <you know. laughs> Yeah. It just, uh, there was another movie set in the 1970s that came out like two years ago, uh, and I think they specifically set it in the 70s. It, I think House of the Devil, I think it is, about this girl that goes to babysit uh, in a house kind of in a rural setting. And, you know, the movie would be over in about 10 seconds if she had a cell phone enough brains to use it, you know. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah. And I think we also felt felt strongly that one of the things, obviously, you know, we talked about the sort of cosmic horror and, and uh, uh, the profound impact uh, 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 and that sort of really, really unique cultural contribution of Lovecraft's uh, to our world um, and to our unending nightmares. But I, one of the things that I think we feel is important about Lovecraft is uh, his, his sort of contribution as a funny kind of, not social critic, but as as a person in a very particular place and time, whose you know horrific visions and his you know uh, anxieties, his 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 real worries about the about you know the limits of knowledge, our relationship to the past, um, you know, question, really questions of power, questions of meaning and religion. We we think that those are pretty tied with historical developments around that period in a way. That yeah, that's a good period point. allows us to d directly address the themes that were really driving Lovecraft to write to tell some of these stories. Also, we didn't want to write about a Tumblr or Instagram uh, account that showed horrors beyond your imagination. <laughs> we, we, uh, we, we, we tossed it around and couldn't go with it. Right. <laughs> Do you have a scene at the university library? Yes. Yep. Yes, we do. We shot that at Vassar College, actually. They have a beautiful Gothic, sort of neo-Gothic library, I guess. Maybe we, it's from the the building was built in 1903, um, and it, it's it's a really gorgeous building. So we we had the fortune of shooting there. Um, had some problems shooting there. Uh, they have a computerized system for their ventilation and their lights, um, which we really had a tough time dealing with. 
Uh, so, you know, we, we made it work. Uh, and when I we made it work, literally we went around with the DP and some production assistants and unscrewed about 100 light bulbs um, in order to get the lighting correct. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it, was, it was interesting, but yes, yeah, so we do have the, the library at Miskatonic. Um, let's just squad. Yeah, we have a, some faculty housing. You know, it's no. tough. Sorry, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead. I'm well, we shot um, a lot of our interiors we shot at a, a, um, a Franciscan friary uh, in upstate New York. Oh, wow. and, yeah, the friar came down the stairs in the, in the cold dark in his, in his uh, robe. He gave me the keys to an abandoned wing built in the 20s. <laughs> And he oh, said, wow. I didn't go to that shoot. Man. I was <laughs> like, no, I've seen that movie. Uh, <laughs> there was no heat. This, this uh, almost turned into a found footage movie. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah so he, he said, you know, have fun. And, uh, and then we went down, we did our lunch, uh, actually, with the Friars. So we went uh, from the cold, dark wing into their modern-day cafeteria and had lunch with the Friars. Uh, so, yeah, it's um, it's been quite an interesting experience just shooting these locations. Have, have fun shooting some nameless horror, boys, and when you're done, let's do some lunch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, speaking of that, I mean, we've talked, we mentioned the, the tentacle and the, 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 the icker factor uh, um, several times now. I, I just want to say, don't get trapped by that, because I think Scott David Anilowski, with his story in Early Frost, where it's a crystalline entity, uh, Ramsey Campbell's yeah. of the voice of the beach, mm -hmm. where it's just sand. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the definitions, if you go to Wikipedia of Lovecraftian horror, is that it has tentacles in in slime. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't have to. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Um, That's a big Ted, conversation that we had. Yeah, Ted Growl's piece, uh, the screamer, mm -hmm. really turned everything on upside down. His his Lovecraftian monster is this big. Hmm. And hmm. it's like a praying mantis thing that just howls. Hmm. But we don't have to go big and, and, and slimy. Yeah. yeah, you know, a lot of people, Pete, were bitching about the end of Cabin in the Woods, that it was a huge hand, and I, I just I just feel like... Oh, it, I hadn't seen it yet. <laughs> oh, shit. Are you serious? <laughs> Are you oh, serious? that's serious. I've seen it like twelve times. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Son of a bitch. Yeah. Where's the kick? Where's the kick button? You're out of here. <laughs> no, but but you know, I don't. You're right. The, uh, this these gods or these super powerful a ancient aliens. It, it doesn't really have anything to do with tentacles. I think that perhaps is what scared Lovecraft himself. That that type of thing. But but uh, it doesn't have to be that. Yeah, one of one of my favorite stories by Lovecraft is the color out of space. And mm -hmm. the reason I love that, aside from, well, because it opens with this sweeping uh, description of New England countryside, and I just think it's it's really beautiful prose. But also because um, because unlike some other Lovecraft stories, it's not a tentacled monster. It's not about an old one per se. It's basically about a wrong place, wrong time, and the and the antagonist or or the creature the. Uh, the danger is from a color that you can't describe. Um, and I, when I first read that, I thought that's a really, really interesting take on a monster, on some sort of nemesis, which where it's like something you you take for granted, something innocuous, generally, gen yeah, which well, is like a color. But this color kills you. One of the things we've talked about in these chats before is what would a um, what would a alien from another dimension look like to us? And I've mentioned, I'll use the example again of the novel Flatland. Um, it's about, I don't know if, if anyone's read it, it's about a three-dimensional uh, sphere mm -hmm. that appears in a two-dimensional world. And right. the two-dimensional creatures, of course, they can't see them as a sphere. All they see is, is the edge. And so they can't really perceive it as it really is. And that's a very interesting thing to think about as well, you know. Does anybody here know uh, Watchmen, the comic book? Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. There. You have the tentacle monster here. Oh, yeah. yeah. You see, well, and then there was a movie, and I missed this thing. Yeah. <laughs> I really missed this. 
I, I've I waited for, for it a wow, it was a big tentacle monster and nothing. It's just this blue explosion and that was it. I was so disappointed with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that you bring that up though because I I uh it, I, and you're obviously disagreeing with me, and that's fine, and probably maybe other people will too. But I actually thought the the tentacled monster in the comic book was kind of an unnecessary addition because they already had um, a you know basically a god in the story that could do all of that. All they had to do was blame it on him. So which which they did in the movie. One one of the reasons they cut that out was because it would be too much like an episode of The Outer Limits. But but this in a movie is what be Look great. <laughs> Both New York destroyed with six Well, if we meet our fifty thousand dollar stretch goal, we're on it. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily yeah. we had Hellboy to add some tentacles back into our big uh, Hollywood yeah. films. Right. Yeah, no tentacle, like, no. Like I mean I, I would say we're not anti tech tentacle. I love uh, that this is a thing. <laughs> yeah. this is a we the, Where do you land on the pro con tentacle debate? We're, yeah. we're moderates when it comes to tentacles. Thank uh, goodness, because I, I really I don't want that kind of bigotry on my show. So. <laughs> well I think tentacles have the right to marry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know why we're debating this. So of course they have the right to marry. If you like tentacles, don't read my books. Because I don't go there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say that the, I think the dream quest of Unknown Kadath is a great just potpourri of weird Lovecraftian creatures. Yeah, I don't cool. think a tentacle shows up once in that story. Also, now I'm thinking of Lovecraft potpourri and wondering what that is. <laughs> <laughs> that's a separate Kickstarter. I've already got dibs on that. <laughs> I believe that's, from, that's available from Phoenix Alchemy, though. Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh my goodness! How, how did you guys? How did you three guys get into Lovecraft originally? Were you reading Lovecraft when you were kids? Or did you come to it later? Um, you know what got you interested in Lovecraft? I mean, you know some people read Lovecraft and okay, great stories. They know they don't really go on to be, you know, a bunch of Lovecraft nerds like the rest of us. So what what kept you there? Let me let me let me summarize that. What screwed you guys up? Yeah. Oh, exactly. yeah exactly. Uh, childhood. Yeah. 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 I, I, I mean, I, I I know everyone's coming in from all around the world. I will tell you that New England has a very unique um, vibe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, you know, this is a weird coincidence. I actually mentioned to Mike in an email. Um, I was reading The Shadow Out of uh, Time, which I had never read before, just recently when I was scouting uh, the, the location at Vassar College and I was riding the train and the protagonist in that story was born a street next to the street that I grew up on in Haverhill, oh, wow. Massachusetts. Right. Ooh. Yeah, you did mention that. He said Boardman Street, which is the street that I lived on when I moved to Newburyport, Massachusetts, which is where In's, Shadow Over In's Mouth is supposed to take place. Haverhill. So and I, so I had this. It was like I had my own mini cosmic horror moment. Wait, why are we still friends? You never yeah. told me this. <laughs> I, I actually Google mapped it just to confirm. It said Go Golden Hill. I'm looking at this. I, it totally freaked me out. It's. I mean, it's. I guess it's a coincidence. But I will say that you walk around in New England uh, during a certain time of year, particularly in the fall. Yeah. You just feel it, I guess. I don't know. I um. Uh, well, yeah. I my introduction to Lovecraft was primarily because my sister is a bibliophile. She she's an avid reader, um, and she got really into Stephen King, um, and she's my older sister by three years, and she's always been smarter than me. Um, so naturally, I felt competitive, and when I found out that Stephen King was influenced by somebody, I tried to one up my sister by getting <laughs> uh, interest uh, by reading some Lovecraft. But what really clinched it for me was in our hometown in Maine. Uh, I, was, I, was casually, I was casually talking about Lovecraft, a couple of stories that I had read at a comic book store um, uh, that, I would, that I would hang around in sometimes. And uh, there was a guy there who was an avid Lovecraft fan. I didn't know this. Um, he randomly saw me on the street the next day, ran up to me, said, they're selling a bus of Cthulhu about six inches high, but it's $50, and I don't know if my girlfriend will let me get it. Do you think I should get it anyways? I didn't even know the dude's name. Um, and I was like, yeah, I, yes, I think you should. He was like, awesome, thanks, man. 
And then a day later, that same guy let me into a punk show for free through the uh, through the back door. Uh, and I was just like, <laughs> okay, yeah, Lovecraft is just giving. Like this is basically like this is basically like being part of the Silver Twilight Lodge for like fifteen year olds who don't have a place to go. Um, so yeah, I, I got into uh, I got into um, Lovecraft through it's the, the community. Honestly, the community was extremely supportive, very rewarding, um, and, um, and they would often help me try to understand what Lovecraft was saying due to the man's uh, use of terms I was not that... I, I didn't know the big words he used, so they helped me out. Are you guys going to the film festival? Is that in Portland, Oregon? Yes. I'll um, be right back, guys. Okay. okay. Um, as of now, no, um, um. but uh, maybe... I don't know. We... Our problem is, I mean, we're on the East Coast, and the film's not finished. Uh, when is the actual, when is that festival, actually? It's the first weekend of May, May 3rd through 5th. Oh, this May. Okay, yeah. so I would say that's when we're shooting, so the answer is definitely no. But okay. they do it every year, right? Yes. So we'll probably submit our short when it's finished to them, and hopefully come next year. Okay, cool. How about Necronomicon Providence this August? Oh, yeah. Yes, we plan to be there. We plan to show the film there. That's where we're going to premiere it. Wonderful. See you guys there. Yeah. Right? That's cool that, that you guys are all going to be there, I guess, huh? Yeah. Uh, it sounds like it's going to be quite a... Shindig? Yeah, we're all guests, so... It, it's going to be the coolest Lovecraft gathering of all time. <laughs> all the cool kids we're are... We're in. We're done. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, baby. I'm sorry. For I'll the be there in spirit, and I'll hear all oh, about it from yeah, you lot on, on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, it's, it'll it'll it's, it'll be an excellent venue for you to premiere the film because um, filmmakers, writers, artists, um, if you do a good job, the rewards will be plenty. No if you <laughs> fuck up, if you fuck up, we'll all talk about you. Excellent. <laughs> and, and you don't know us, but we're not shy. <laughs> I'm shy. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Are. Yeah. And when you meet with Michael Bay, <laughs> remind him of what they did on the set of Dracula, which is absolutely <laughs> stunning to me, is that they filmed Dracula during the day. And at night, after the cast went home, they filmed in Mexico. A whole new cast came in, and they filmed a Spanish language Dracula, which is better than the original. Which is better than the original. And it's on DVD if you have the Universal Monsters set. Yep. Wow. And we all know about this, so why am I even bothering? To I, I didn't know. Yeah, Rob, I didn't know. Well, that's a great. Piece Amazing. of trivia right there. So what you're telling us is that we should also shoot a Spanish-speaking version of our film by night. By night. By night. That's what that's what the we'll takeaway here is. Yeah. Well, we have <laughs> about 24 hours left on the Kickstarter. That's the new stretch goal. Yeah. Yeah. We'll we'll just. <laughs> I'll email it to my friend down in Mexico City and see what uh, he can drum up for us. Uh, actually, it, 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 it should be an Italian version because because Lovecraft loves Italian food. So you should do an Italian version. Okay. <laughs> did, did he really love Italian food? That, oh, that yeah. Is, Minestrone that's, was that's, it. That's debatable. <laughs> no, 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 it is not, girlfriend. Hello. When, ST jo when I took S.T. Joshi to an Italian restaurant, he had to have Minestrone because that was Lovecraft's favorite food. And S.T. Joshi would know. Uh, alternatively, I've heard there's this new technology. I think they call them subtitles. You can do that. <laughs> Mike, where is the fun in that? Yeah, I know. I'm no fun. There's uh, also dubbing. Yeah. <laughs> dubbing sucks. <laughs> I've been dubbing three, sucks three years time. watching German TV. You know what Ice T sounds like on Law and Order? <laughs> <laughs> if if you do it right, the guys who used to make spaghetti westerns did a lot of effort in the dubbing. They used to have a guy rewrite the dialogue to fit the lips. Oh, no, 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 it's, it's not that. Really? It's not just that. Um, it, it, tonally, inflections. Uh, it, it, no, you, you can't dub. You can't, <laughs> can't ever dub step. When yeah. we're all in Providence, <laughs> we have to have Italian food up on Federal Hill. Been there, done that. 
Well, I think that's. Oh, we'll a do it again. Cool. There's a great, there's a great Tex-Mex place up on the hill. Hey. Oh, we know how you love chili. You chili, baby. It, do you guys think this isn't just for 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 Jim and and, and company? But do all of you think that um, you know this knowledge that you get that that drives you insane? You know, sometimes that can be. Uh, you know, you find out that maybe, no offense, I'm, I'm talking in theory, there's Christians and there's atheists in this chat and watching, I'm sure, but in theory you find out in the story that let's say, there is no God, but wait, there is, and, you know, he's about to step on the planet, stuff like that. Um, it, that's probably more conducive to, you know, early to mid 20th century than, you know, the 21st century as well. As far as setting your movie in a in a, in a that time period, you guys agree yeah. with that? No, that's a that's a great question. It's one of the things. One, it's one of the things that we've talked about that we're really interested. I think to hear one of the things you, you I think you often hear about. You know, one of the reasons people get very excited about Lovecraft sometimes is is a perceived sense of nihilism in mm -hmm. in the work that 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 it is about that discovery of you know not only. It, <laughs> For, you know, one might start from the worry that there isn't a God, but then you discover, no, in fact, there is, and it definitely does not love you. Right, uh, in fact, exactly. It's not even really particularly aware of your insignificant existence. Um, and, that, and that that, you know, and I think a lot of people talk about Lovecraft uh, uh, as if that sort of was the sum total of his contribution or, 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 or you know, it, it is, is this fundamental part of, of the work. But I think, and, and certainly I think that, Part of cosmic horror is this this uh, the you know the the in, insanity inducing revelation that your your basic understanding of the universe is fundamentally false or is yeah. you know a very thin layer of ice on like a bottomless cold you know murky lake of horror. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, L Lovecraft wasn't in many ways himself really a nihilist. I mean, a lot of, and I'm sure all of you probably read many of his letters and things like that. But but there were there were many perfectly, and you know, maybe um, Minestrone Soup is, is a great example. There there are many sort of things uh, about you know human life and, that he was a great lover of. You know, people don't often don't talk. Um, you know, at least in some fan circles, there's not very much discussion about the fact that Lovecraft was a really avid traveler and travel writer. And actually his longest work is, is like this, you know, 80,000 word description of his travels in Virginia. You know, I mean, he, he was this, and he, you know, he collected jargon and folklore and local histories and, and, you know, mo mostly of New England, which is one of the reasons he appeals so much to us. And obviously it appears in his writing, but I, um, you know, I think that that's something that's important about, and something that we want that, that we really. Want. It was one of the reasons I think it felt important for us to, to set it in the particular time and place that it is, was to connect to the things about the world, whether it's architecture or folklore, that is really important. And I think sort of uh, formulated the closest thing to religion that Lovecraft experienced. Well, the other insanity-inducing thing too is that I think people maybe don't give enough credit to is it, 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 I often hear, okay, I see this tentacled monster, why would that drive me insane? But it, if you consider, uh, you know, if I see, a, uh, for example, a tarantula up close, it induces this feeling of, you know, combination of disgust and horror and, and, and all that kind of stuff. You know, maybe it doesn't. Maybe it, for somebody else it's snakes. But if you imagine something like that, uh, the size of a mountain or the size of a skyscraper, then, you know, how much more of those feelings would you experience? You know, I, I can see somebody starting to gibber insanely at that point, so. <laughs> there, there is a, there's a scene like that in the German adaptation of the Colorado space, the farmer. Yeah. It, it, it was the uh, wife of the farmer and... The, but in large, I don't want to ruin the film, but there's, there's something larger than you expect to see that's an insect. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, also, I think that, um, also, I think that a lot of Lovecraft's, uh, a lot of Lovecraft stories, when somebody's uh, sanity or mental capacity does finally break, um, that uh, is that it, it, 
sometimes it, uh, he, he writes about it as if it's a, it's a reflexive action from the uh, human consciousness to push away the things that the person just learned. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's, uh, I mean that, that, that happens. Uh, denial. Yeah, denial, basically, like off the top of my head, yeah. um, uh, Whisper in the Darkness, like uh, that at the end. like the Anybody hear me? What's Raymond and uh, trying to hang, hang on to its sanity? It seems like it seems like a, a almost muscular reflex, like a basically a gag reflex of the mind, uh, in order to push it away once once it's been uh, obtained. But I also think that um, one of the things that's kind of about Lovecraftian horror is that essentially what the knowledge of the outer gods and things is is knowledge of our arrogance is misplaced. Mm -hmm. We are not on top. Nobody cares about us, and I think kind of God is just the name we put on that. That's how we understand it. Again, back to what Mike was talking earlier about the things that we can't really understand because we've never seen them before. Mm -hmm. We haven't had that experience of we're not on top, so we're just going to put the name on it that God hates us mm -hmm. and that's it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's true. It's true. Uh, you guys really need to be on your best behavior now because um, Molly uh, Yes, she's a prude. <laughs> Hi everybody. Hello. Uh, guys, this is Molly Tanzer. She's an no. author as well. She wrote a book, Lovecraftian book called um, A Pretty Mouth. Very good book. So I, I just read that. It's excellent. Oh, why? Thank you. I had, I had read the Ivy Bridge Twins before in the oh. Book of Cthulhu, but I hadn't read the whole oh. interrelated s stories you wrote. Oh well, thank and you very I, much. I love the PG Warehouse. Uh, Oh, thank you. Yeah, I was feeling cheeky. I don't know. <laughs> hey, so Mike, it's uh, seven o'clock for us here, Eastern Time. Yep. Um, we we actually got to cut out. Uh, no problem. Apparently, it's the Game of Thrones premiere tonight. Yes, I don't know. it is. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's, some people got to run and start cooking up some. Do you um, look at me with accusing eyes? <laughs> 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 Allowed to like things. Thank you. Well, I, I really appreciate you guys. I mean, we're probably gonna if you guys want to keep chatting. I'm that's fine with me. I I want to as well. But uh, we really appreciate you guys being on and letting us know about more about the movie and and uh, I I actually I think you told me in an email, but I had forgotten that you're gonna be at Necronomicon. So I'm I'm really looking forward to that. So yeah, and we yeah. really appreciate you having us on here. Um, it's great to meet all of you. Yeah, it's really it's it's an honor to be on the on this webcast. I I feel. Um, I think, uh, and and uh, that you posted our, our thing on your site and on Facebook, you know, all of that. I think it's it's so helpful when you do these Kickstarters. Sometimes before you click that launch button, you just have this moment of Lovecraftian dread. <laughs> uh, yeah, so sure. uh, it's it, it it's an experience, you know, to to go through this idea. Okay, I'm going to put this idea out there, and hopefully people are going to respond. And uh, clearly, people are responding. Um, and I know now it's on us to produce, uh, so we do hope that we can put together something nice uh, for you guys to see. Um, and we will definitely, hopefully, see at least most of you at uh, at Necronomicon. Uh, let me ask you one last question before you run. Uh, sure. Will you, if everything goes well, uh, will you do a, a second Lovecraftian movie at some point? Maybe not your next film, but is that something you've thought about? Uh, I, yeah, David just said hell yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, one of the reasons I'm I'm here right now, it's like because when Jim uh, said like, oh, somebody wants to interview us uh, with video chat, I got scared, and I was just like, about what is it going to be about? Like the filming procedures? Like, no, he wants to talk about Lovecraft. I was like, fuck yeah! I told him to talk about <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty impressed. I I'm very pretty much looking forward to meeting you guys at Necronomicon and, and seeing the movie and. Um, uh, you guys are doing Lovecraftians a service by, you know, creating something like this, and we appreciate it too. So, so thanks for being here. Fantastic. Thanks, thank, yeah. thank you so much, guys. Yeah, we'll uh, talk to you guys soon. Keep us posted. So. Absolutely. Will do. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. -bye. Bye. Uh, okay, now you guys can misbehave. <laughs> <laughs> oh, still, Molly. Still on the air? Yeah, we're still on the air. Oh, jeez. So I have some good news for you. What? I got a lovely email this week from Oliver Wyman. Who's that? The voice actor. Oh, 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 right, right. Paul is doing Reanimators the novel, yes? 
He is. He's already done it for audible.com. That is awesome, Pete. I think it was last week that I asked you, or maybe it was two weeks ago, if you're going to get it. Yeah, it was last week. Yeah. So. Isn't that amazing? I ask, and then things just happen. The universe loves you. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> As a Lovecraftian, you should you should doubt that, that the universe loves you. I don't think so. No, no, yeah, it doesn't. In fact, it doesn't <laughs> so, even know I'm here. And when it so did, Pete, it next, next will be the HBO miniseries that you'll be flying us all to Florida for the week on the yacht, right? Oh, yeah. Florida. Hi. <laughs> Actually, you know, in deference to Willem, we'll all just go to 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 uh, the Vermont. I want to go to Vermont. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Fine. They I've been to Vermont like they... fifty thousand times. Okay. But it's uh, cold was... in Vermont in the winter. <laughs> That's good. Good. Uh, I was so excited when Willem told me he was too tired to go to church that he was going to be on the chat. So. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Yeah. And I got a good email too. I got the PDF for uh, Bohemians of Tesla Valley. Ooh. Awesome. It's my my book, my next book from Arcane Wisdom. And it's a book that I wrote because I was so excited about Necronomicon in Providence. So I've dedicated the book to Niall Neil how do you say his name, Neil? Or is it Niall? I always Neil, want to call him Niall. I believe it's Niels. Yeah, it's Neil. So it's dedicated to him and the convention. I gotta have him on soon to, so he can tell us what's give us the latest with Necronomicon. I think there's a lot, a hell of a lot of people are going to show up to that thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to bring all the books I want to get signed. Yeah. But maybe that's a Does first. Does Providence book. have a marina? <laughs> <laughs> yes, as a matter of fact, Providence does have a marina. And the, in fact, the hotel, the hotel? Abuts, yeah, the hotel abuts to the marina. So we'll just be bringing the yacht up, which means I have to leave four days early. So who all is going to the film festival? I am. Yeah, me. The, the film festival? Yeah. Yeah. I'm Aren't there. you going, Molly? I am. Oh, good. Cool. Yeah, we can we can do a we can do an evening chat on Sunday at the oh, film festival. That actually that was that well, was, that's already been planned. Yeah, oh, that was well. the one thing that I I Joe and I had to do in order for them to. It, that was the stretch goal. We're we're gonna do the oh. easing chat from there. So. But and I'm we'll not be doing my computer, so we, it's, it's going to be a, a what a group thing. Or just all going to have a, a camera and film it as a group? Uh, I don't oh, that Mike part. and I are still talking. We're we're, okay. we're going to do updates. We're going to walk around and do little mini interviews and post stuff. And we can go to right. a bar. Well, we're if, if do we have to share, if, if we have to share computers, then I get to sit on Joe's lap. Yeah, there you go. Well, <laughs> you, first you're behind me, pulling me like this. Now you're on my lap? Uh-huh. Uh, guys, uh, this is Todd, speaking of video and photography. And Todd is hey, going to do a lot of photography at Necronomicon for me and Niels. Um, and his friend's going to do a lot of uh, video. We're going to attempt to help Niels out by giving him enough material for a DVD. So. That's right. Are, are you going to be at the film festival, Todd, or just Necronomicon? Uh, just Necronomicon. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the funds right now to make it out west, but being the convention is only 20 minutes from my house in Providence, it's uh, a lot easier that way. Well, Charlotte could probably help you out. With, he could probably fly you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's rich. Right, Pete? <laughs> <laughs> We are very happy. <sighs> Pete, you're going to be hearing the same old jokes for the rest of your life. I'm, I I'm sorry, what can I say? <laughs> mm. It's okay. Well, if, if somebody would buy me Photoshop, then I could start producing all the uh, 
FBI documentation about uh, Rollick's little annex on the boat. But I don't have Photoshop. <laughs> Nobody needs to buy Photoshop anymore. You can go download Paint.net for free. It does all everything Photoshop does. Oh, I never heard of it. Yeah, I don't Paint. know any of this technical stuff. Paint.net. So, oh, okay. Close enough, anyway. Yeah, it can do some pretty cool stuff. Because I mean, it seems like Facebook allows nudity all the time now, so I can post that stuff. It does. Uh, no nipples. No. I see stuff all the time. There was that bunny girl. I don't know today. because I haven't found out about it yet. There, there was nipples on that bunny girl on Facebook. Okay, you know what? Well, probably be well, I, don't, I don't care if they allow it. I don't want to see it if it's Rollick related. <laughs> <laughs> I just what? don't want to see it. If it's Pete, I don't want to see it. If it's Pete, what, what bunny girl? I didn't see a bunny girl on Facebook. Uh, there was some post this morning about uh, it was a naked girl and body painting, and she was made up like a bunny. And the only thing that wasn't painted over was her nipples. No, that's. And I thought, that. wait a minute! I thought Facebook, you can't do that. And but so, there it was all the interesting stuff, and I miss it. Is it still there, though? <laughs> I what? don't. I don't even remember who posted it. What corner of Facebook are you seeing this on, Joe? Right on the main page thing there. You know, I got. I, I had to censor my photo at the heart, so I don't know. Hmm. Oh yeah, you should post that. I don't know why you haven't. I I it's there, but I I had to I had to black out my. I mean, I have like 30 copies of it on pages of letters. <laughs> I'm going to start selling, selling them. Oh, I, I All right. Cool. Any, if still... anybody watching this wants naked pictures of Willem, <laughs> I have them for sale. Send me a Facebook message. But they ain't cheap, folks. <laughs> oh, yeah, you gotta and there's that. nothing to those. see, my darlings. There's oh, nothing yeah, I... to see. Full, full frontal nudity. Yeah, that big. Okay, well, I didn't say right, it was large. Up. I just said let's clean this up. Let's clean this. Full up. frontal. I didn't say we may have frontal. children watching. Molly, I'm, I'm glad <laughs> this you're time here. of night. I'm what? glad you're here, Molly. Uh, you wait a minute. No, 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 no. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> Molly can say things. Rolly can say things. What? So this tonight it's pulver. What things do I say? <laughs> Coming back to Facebook, I remember I, I posted the trailer of Werewolf Women of the SS by Rob Zombie there, and there are a lot of nipples and uh, Facebook. <coughs> it, it didn't disappear or something. Well, there you have it, folks. Now you can see nipples on Facebook. And we found that out here on, on this show. Hey, it's supposed to be inf information, right? That's right. Okay, yes. there you go. So, Molly, what have you been up to lately? And, and please, please... It's a movie about history. <laughs> please, give us details. Um, uh, I've had some house guests, and I've been traveling. This and that. I went into New York City for a day. Oh, the, after the last time I talked to you. On the chat. Yeah, yeah you were in New York. Yeah, I was, and I went into the city and visited Chinatown and did some stuff. It was really awesome. And then I came back here and, um, yeah, I had house guests, and I had, like, a five-night bender where all we did was play, like, um, Warhammer fantasy role play, and so that kind of ate my life for a little while. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Sorry, that's I... what you were doing instead of reading my book and giving me a blurb? Look, okay, about that. I offered concessions. I was all like, I'll review it, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm just giving you a hard time. Nobody would buy a book on my recommendation anyway. They'd all be, like, too scared. They'd be like, if Molly likes it, <laughs> it's probably full of boys kissing and, like, <laughs> I don't know, like, more incest than a George R. R. Martin novel, so... You don't want that. <laughs> there are no boys kissing in this first book. Yeah, I know. You told me. You see, you told me that too soon. If you had told me there was boys kissing, I would have gotten around to it. <laughs> me too. What have you? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, book five. Why lie? Why lie? Why even pretend? 
No, no. Actually, I, the, the first chapter of book three is written. And, well, why don't you why don't you do the Lovecraftian version of this? You can have boys kissing. Well, all right. Reachy, city of night. Willem, Reachy, city of night. Yes, yes. Ah, uh, that's depressing. Yeah. Doesn't everybody die in the end of that one? No. Oh, great. I haven't read it. Thank you. <laughs> He Sorry. dies, she dies, everybody dies. There's no she's in the city of night. Well, there's some she's like Willem, but that's it. Oh! <laughs> there's, there's a book by Lawrence Block, Matthew Scudder book, and the title is Everybody Dies. Yeah. So, and oh, we have, have to, to, by the way, Mike, we have to it. talk about Block when? after this is over. What did you say? When we're done, we have to talk about Block. Why do we have to wait till we're done? Robert Block? What do you want to say about Block? No, Lawrence Block. No, when we're done with this on for viewing. Oh, okay. So I want to hear what everyone's working on. What are y'all working on, you writers? I just finished my film festival tale for the newspaper. Okay. All right. They're going to kill me because it's almost 4,000 words. Well, that's good. Yeah. Um, I finished a story called The Rendition of Ephraim Wait, which is with my editor right now. You know, she's ripping okay. it to shred. I just sent a new novella to Jeff Thomas, who's editing my next collection. Oh, really? Yeah. Do you have a publisher for it? Yep, but I can't tell you because it's a new imprint. It'll be announced really soon. Okay. Ooh, mystery. So, mystery man. Speaking of Jeffrey Thomas, he, he along with Joe, two separate stories, not along with Joe, but both he and Joe are doing, um, uh, when I do my Kickstarter, one of the big... One of the big pledges, one of the big rewards will be um, being a character in a story, Punk Town story, by Jeffrey Thomas. Cool. He'll also be a character in a whole story. So, so that, that was nice of Jeffrey to, to say yes to. <laughs> yep. Hey, Mike, when are you uh, starting the Kickstarter? Um. I want to I want to have it started before um, April is over. That's the goal. So, anyway, what are you working on, Molly? Oh, um, the novel that wouldn't die, and um, oh, I just got edits back on a short story that's actually set in the same world as the novel. It's like a weird western about like Chinese vampires. Um, like in an illegal betting ring, like like underground boxing ring, but it's like Chinese vampires battling each other. Um, called Chi Sport. You and said it so, was in the West. Yeah, and like the in the it's like a weird Western in like America in like nineteen seventy, like nineteen sixty five. Um, so still during the transcontinental building, but um, yeah, like underground gambling and boxing involving chi sucking vampires. <laughs> <laughs> So, did you say cheese sucking vampires? No, chi. Like oh, chi, chi. Yeah. The cheese is also. You know, Iron Fist. Yeah, I get it. I know the word chi. I just kept saying yeah. cheese, and I was like, chi with seems, a Q. Yeah. It seems to be more uh, ahistorical than uh, Mendingo <laughs> boxing in uh, Django Unchained. I still haven't seen it, and I don't know how I haven't seen it, but I need to watch it. I'm really excited about it. It just like the time got away from me when it was in the theater, but man, I don't know. But that is what I've been working on. Um, who else? Mike, are you writing? I'm gonna. Yeah, I'm writing, but. <coughs> I think I'm gonna have to pass it off to the next person. I'm taking too long. I'm just I get I've been sick for two weeks and I just get way behind on everything else. So get in line. Hmm. Get in line. 
Yeah. Yeah, everyone's we're, been sick. We're all behind, and we're all, and we all been sick. Yeah, it's been crazy this winter. I feel like. Yeah. yeah. I, I want to. Th there's that line from Stephen King. It was the flu. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's yeah. a really rough winter. Yes. Uh, I probably have a book coming out tomorrow. Oh, from cool! Black, from Black Coat Press, it's it's a uh, translation of a French mystery. It's called The Return of Judix. Judix was sort of a French uh, forerunner of the shadow. And from a German perspective, what's interesting is the villain in that book was originally a serial, so they brought, the serial has been lost. It was a silent film serial. But we have the novelization, so I translated that. The villain seems to be the basis for Dr. Malbuza in Germany. Hmm. A lot of similarities. He's, well, one thing, he's German. He's a hypnotist. He keeps meticulous records of every crime he's going to commit. And uh, Fritz Lang was a big, yeah. Fritz Lang was a big fan of uh, the movie director uh, Louis Filliard, uh, who, who made this film. So it's quite likely that this was the basis for at least the Testament, because the first Mabuza movie was based on a book. The second one was largely Lang's uh, or his or his wife Theo von Harbor's idea. Mm. By the way, Rick, I got uh, Shadows of the Opera this week. Uh, that's my oh. next book I'm going to read. So Thank you. I'm a fan of the Opera Net, so I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> oh, you'll like reanimators then. What yeah, is reanimators? I, I, I don't know. What is that? <laughs> Dominique, have you read that chapter from reanimators yet? Me? Yeah. No. Is it? Where is it? It. Um. It's in some episode. It's some. It's in one of the issues of uh, Tales of the Shadow Men, but it's it's one of the major chapters in in Reanimators. Is that the okay. is that is that the Eric Zahn one? Yes. Oh, so that's a chapter in from Reanimator. I didn't know that. Well, I worked it in. It seems to be that I'll look it up. Yeah. One thing, since we were discussing films earlier in dubbing, uh, I don't know how many people know that uh, nearly every European film that was made before uh, the late 70s was dubbed, regardless of what language it was spoken in, because all the sound stages were uh, not tightly controlled, so you had to redub from the beginning. In hmm. fact, if uh, I know Julie's a Dario Argenta fan, Mm -hmm. If you have the anniversary DVD of Suspiria, the, the, there's a whole discussion mm -hmm. about they had to redouble ah. the dialogue. That that explains a lot. I remember. I'll be right back. I gotta go pay the yard man. Okay. okay. In, in fact, that's a lot of reasons why you see horror movies with Christopher Lee made in Germany and in Italy and. Yeah. Don't have it. You don't have him doing his voice because he wasn't available to come back and double his dialogue. Well, mm. I, what I heard was that they expected him to to do it without payment. Yeah, that's part of it too. Or at least he made a joke that there was a Sherlock Holmes movie that uh, they dubbed his voice over on. He said they couldn't afford to pay the train fare from. I think he was living in Monte Carlo back then, Monte Carlo to Berlin or something. Wait, can, can we just pause for a second? Pause. Um, Willem went to pay the yard man. <laughs> yeah, Miss James Whale just exited the building to pay the yard man. <laughs> so when we come back, we can query him about gods and monsters. So maybe maybe he's the one we should be ribbing about being rich. But I I'm just concerned about this poor yard man. <laughs> yeah, <Just, laughs> maybe. You know, we can ask you how much he pays him, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could tell you, but I won't. Yeah, you have to do your own yard work, don't you, Pete? I don't have a yard. I have a boat. Oh, right. <laughs> what does he need a yard for? He's got a 36-foot. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> if, if the area around the house gets a little dirty, we just move. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
Do you remember that Stephen King story about the guy who uh, sort of mows the lawn and then he the lawnmower man? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a really bad movie. Yeah, it has nothing to do <laughs> the with the movie. Stayed, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm actually I'm I, I'm in the mood to watch a really good movie. I wish Jack Reacher was out on on DVD. I I just put um uh, John dies at the end. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> What's oh, and and because of you people, I I actually watched Cabin in the Woods the other night. Oh yeah. Oh, did. oh it's so think? good. I didn't go to sleep. <laughs> I heard a lot of stuff about this movie, but I... It's pretty rad. I like to pretend that Bradley Whitford's playing the same character that he plays in the West Wing, but in the future of the West Wing. No, right. so yeah, he oh, there you go. Yeah. After the Bartlett administration, like, that's right. what he, he does. Right. <laughs> that's very Walt Newton of you, Molly. You should no, write this red story. Oh, Mr. Whale is back. Hi, Mr. Whale. Is the yard man oh. satisfied now? Yeah. He's going to help me get a ladder. You, yeah, you everything's cool. Him. So. Is he young and ripped and all that? No. No? <laughs> no, but he's, a, he's, he's an excellent yard man. Okay. And, um. So, oh. what did you what did you think have you of? ever had him in, like to sketch him or give him a drink? No, that's, I, I hired cowboys beer. for that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but you already know that, girlfriend. Yeah, oh, I, I know, darling. Uh huh. Willem, you didn't say what you're working on. Um, I'm I'm the waiting until my next. I'm just about to have two books published, and I, I kind of want to wait until they're out. Um, I don't plan on having a book published next year. I want to just go really slow and and try to find a new direction, perhaps, or do something different. Um, I've, I've, I've written too many books. I need to slow down. How's the novel coming? You went a lot published over years. The novel ain't going to happen. I haven't even read this. But you're too fast for me. It's I, you know, I'm 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 just about to have two hardcover limited editions out, and it's I it's you know I I thought I was going to die and have a heart attack and die, and so I wrote all these books because I said I couldn't die until I had more books out, and then. I didn't die. It was such a bummer. So <laughs> well, you have to keep on writing. So, <laughs> like so now I kind of have to slow down. I now I have to slow down and and. Um, you 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 had gathered dust come out. And yeah. You had uncommon places. And I've you got know, the. It, yeah. It's uh, like a, well, I, I had three books out last year. I had two. I'm having. A book, my next two books are going to come out probably within weeks of each other in next month. And it's like, it's crazy. It's like, it's time to stop and and find, do something different or do something, I don't know what. I tried to write a novel. I am not a novelist. Um, so I've given up on that. I, I do want to write, I want to return to writing my little, um, Things based on fungi from Yuzis or the easy, um, you know. But for the moment, I just want to. I want to be lazy. I want to do a lot of reading, and I need to get used to um, a new life. You know, a new way of living without without my my mother around and being alone and feeling strange and you know, I'm I'm adjusting to a new life. Yeah, I'm sure the house is pretty quiet. The house is really quiet. Yeah. You know, I live with a ghost, and um, I, I hardly ever see him. I, I love sitting in the living room and reading. I, I have a lot of books I want to read. Um, I get a lot of books sent to me from the publishers and things. And so it's, it's kind of like I'm just... 
you know, being laid back. And, um, of course, a lot of, for me, a lot of the work of writing comes from reading. And so I feel like I'm still, I'm still in the writing mode. I'm just, I'm not doing the physical work. And it, that's okay. I've written a lot of stuff. And I want my next big project to be different, unique, and the best things I've ever done. So I, I just, I need to think about that and uh, just, you know, just go slow. That's what I say, you know, then maybe two weeks, two weeks from now, all of a sudden, I'll have my next book halfway written. Who knows, Don? Uh -huh. I, I can never predict, but I feel like I'm really slowed down, and, uh, yeah. What did you think of Kevin in the Woods, Joe? It was okay. I really liked when Sigourney Weaver popped up. I wasn't expecting that. That was that was worth staying awake for. Yeah. Um, for a horror movie, it was okay. <laughs> and and from Joe Pulver, that is high praise. Yeah. Joe's always a tough critic. I I'm just not a big horror movie fan. I love film, but I'm not a horror movie guy. I really like The Awakening. Yeah, that was good. Except for. Part of that is I think that girl, I wish I could remember her name, Rebecca Hall, she was in the town. She's a brilliant young actress. That's, I, 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 so, that's pretty you know, awesome on Netflix right now, too. Um, you know. Um, I haven't I think that one scene in The Awakening was one of the creepiest scenes I've ever watched in a film. I don't. I don't want to give it away for people that haven't seen it. But when she's looking into the dollhouse, yeah, that that creeped the shit out of me. That bothers me as much as the one scene in the uh, George C. Scott Exorcist. Just wow. Um, no, the, the you know there was nothing wrong with Cabin in the Woods, and there were some things there. There were. Some of the interplay with Bradley Whitford and, and the other guy, who I can never remember his name, yeah, was real funny. I, I, I really enjoyed those two guys together a lot. Um, the stuff in the cabin was like, oh, come on. Uh, you know, um, you know, and for, for eight minutes or 12 minutes, it's like, Oh, that's such and such. Oh, that's that. Oh, that that's that. It's like okay, you used every trope that's ever been. That was you, the point. You could have, though. You used yeah. half of them and got the point across. Well, um, I, thought, I thought Thor did a great job. Oh yeah, that was totally Thor, and I didn't even yeah. recognize him. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, they they filmed it about two years before Thor came yeah. out. Yeah. So, yeah, he looked younger. He did. Um, yeah. He really did. You know, I, I, I really love the idea of the movie, um, and and it was made well enough. It just, it's not my kind of film. You know, I mean. Do you like many horror comedies? He doesn't like I, horror. I, I'm not a big horror film fan. Yeah, but I mean, like, I feel like horror comedies kind of are their own thing. And, and I'm not a big comedy fan either. I like drama. Well, this was going to be a slam dunk for you. You know, um, uh, you know, I, I liked horror movies when I was a kid, and then, you know, I was there opening night for Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and you know, all that stuff, and. We switched gears, and I didn't care anymore. I I, I don't I, I don't like zombies, and I don't like slashers. Yeah, I, I'm I'm kind of with that too. I like the more classical horror. Um, you know, I I just can never get my head around zombies. It's I love ghouls. I think I'll, zombies I'll, are so boring. Show me ghouls. Ghouls think they. You know, I mean. Ghouls gone wild. Ghouls I don't know. Maybe I don't know. Zombies are so popular. I mean, 
They're so boring. I, I don't I don't want mindless unless it's the mindless ones in Doctor Strange. You know. Um, well, the reason I think that zombies is so popular is purely from an anthropological standpoint. Zombies represent something. Slashers represent something. That's why they keep coming back and they won't go away. Yeah. Mm. What, what? Just, it's just not something I'm interested in watching, that's all. It's not, I'm not saying I'm right. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with them. It's just not where my taste lies as far as film. You know? Fair enough. Speaking of... of, of not where your taste lies when it comes to film. My son and I watched Dread the other night. That was fun. Well, then, is it how is it? It's not a bad movie. No. It's a popcorn movie. It's a popcorn movie. You know? That's okay. This was like the boringest chat ever. It looks boring to me. <laughs> well, you don't have that? to worry about a sequel. Yeah. No. Has anybody, anybody seen that new Bates Motel uh, series? Just, yeah, I've seen that. Just a question: Does Dread take his helmet off in the, in the no. movie? No, no, no. Oh, that's that's good. In the comic books, he never does this. That's that's great. That's why it was kind of surprising that Irvin <clears> took <throat> the role, but he knew up front that you know he would get no face time, pun intended. Um, image pros. I I watched the first Bates Motel, but it I, I'm 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 I love Robert Block and and when they showed the mother undressing and she was her son saw her in her panties and her bra I just thought that's not that's not the psycho that that I re, I remember or that I want to get into so. So I, it's it's weird what turns me off, but it was like it was trying to be too sexy and and too 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 gory or something. Or, they went or, for pure shock value. Yeah, and to me that's not. That's, it didn't. You know, look, it didn't. I didn't. It didn't look interesting to me. I haven't seen it. it. I you know, I I'm not gonna watch it again. Yeah, I only saw the I only saw the first episode, and my main objection was. If you blinked, you wouldn't know Robert Block had anything to do with this TV series. No. It popped up in the end credits as like the first thing when it's on a small screen. I was expecting at least in you know the beginning of the series to say based on a novel by Robert Block, and you don't get that till at the end. So that mm. that turned me off for if for any other reason. Plus, I'll tell you what the whole thing to me. <laughs> I'm just going to say it. It looks like bad parenting, you know? <laughs> well, wasn't that kind of what the movie was about, though? <laughs> well, the, it, well, the interesting thing about the movie is that Bates in the novel doesn't look anything like Anthony Perkins. He looks like Martin Balsam, who played the detective. Yeah. Like they swapped the two characters if you read the physical descriptions. The movie has a mystique. And... And that mystique is entirely missing in this new TV drama. Uh, well, it seems like they just they just abandoned all the Hitchcockian elements. Yeah, they made it common. Yeah. They it, it, they re they removed what was ingenious, and they've made it into the everyday thing that you see everywhere else. There's well, has anybody everything. seen Hitchcock? No. Yeah. The movie? Yeah. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Uh, I, I, I had read reviews that said it wasn't very good, but I watched it anyway, and I, I enjoyed it. You, um, I, I had no idea about the relationship with his wife. That in total, well, I, totally I did. intrigued me. I, I did. And well, of course, it, it was just absolute pleasure to watch Helen Mirren half naked. Oh, she's fabulous. Yeah. You know. <laughs> so... I did stay awake to watch Helen Mirren with Close not me. too many clothes on. You you got a totally different take though on Hitchcock in in the movie uh, The Girl, which was about Tippi Hedren and Hitchcock. Mm. Why are you, why are you laughing, that. Daniel? Daniel, why are you laughing? Uh, uh, in the beginning, 
Joe was telling us about some bunnies he encountered on Facebook. Then he's telling us about Helen Mirren half naked. I mean, what what are your your preferences when you surf on Facebook or watch movies? <laughs> I like girls. Not anything else. Just just because I take pictures in hotel rooms with Willem, all gusty. <laughs> I like girls, okay? Don't go there, Joe. Don't go there. These these pictures in the hotel room with Willem, that that was those were just celebrity things. Honey, that did. was one picture, please. Will we well, see it on Facebook? I, I think Stan took more than one though. <laughs> well I, I I don't know. So okay. what's wrong with liking girls? Nothing. I like There's girls. Nothing. You know, girls are a good girls thing. Let me tell you. Yes, there will be uh, <laughs> this year. I, I believe a, a sequel to Sin City, a dame to kill for. <laughs> oh really? There. Yeah, yeah Frank Miller. I'm done with him. I wish we could. I wish we could. We could get Stan to Necronomicon, but yeah, I wish we could too. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, Joe, how long are you going to be laid, up, laid over at DFW? I, um, I don't know. You saw the itinerary. You told me five hours. I don't know. I, yeah, I think it's I don't know. I know that I'm stuck in a plane for like 23 hours and 20 minutes. Oh, my gosh. This yeah. is a first world problem. Excuse me? <laughs> I'm going from Berlin to London to Dallas to Portland. Don't give me any first world bullshit. <laughs> uh, how many people live in the town you live in, Rollick? Uh, a couple million. Yeah, okay, well, like a, six, a million billion. There's six million, there's six million right outside my window. <laughs> I and see your, we, your window, by the, the way. And and we even took down the last bit of the wall this week, okay? Yes. Despite it, the fact that whatever the hell that guy Knight Rider was in town. Dave Hasselhoff? Hasselhoff. Oh yeah, that's the guy, yeah. You know? He I was over at the wall be... singing his you know, take down that wall, Mr. Gorbachev song. <laughs> we had a little traffic jam. You had a traffic jam well, because he was in town? Because <laughs> David Hasselhoff was here. He's still that popular? I don't know. He's Isn't German, he one right? Of these beach guys yeah. like Rollick? <laughs> Didn't he have some beach TV show or something? We Germans just want some, someone to laugh about. It's, it's, it's not really popular. <laughs> yes, he had some beach show. That, that show would have been canceled if not for Europe. What was the name of that show? Baywatch. Oh, yeah, that's it. Baywatch. Well, I was never good about watching TV, so. Yeah. Baywatch also had a lot of girls. Well, all of this talk about beefcake is making me hungry, so I'm going to go. Yeah, I got a boogie, too. Yeah, me, too. All right. Thanks for being here, guys. Bye. 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 It was fun. It was fun. Thank you. Yeah. I'll, see, I'll see some of you in Portland. Yes, yes, you yeah, will. Totally. <laughs> okay, yeah, bye bye. 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 See you, Will. Mm. Anyway. Mm -mm. Okay. So and then you, didn't like, you didn't like the book, and so you want to discuss it after we're off the air. Is that it? No. Are we off the air? No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, on a totally different note, did anybody see Doctor Who last night? No. Wait, was that the season premiere? Yeah. I back. missed it. Oh. They don't show it here. You can watch it on Amazon, Pete. What was it about? Well, it um, had to do with uploading souls to the internet. Oh. Or uploading, you know, whatever you just call it, your brain, your your inner essence. It was, it was it really wasn't religious, but it was the equivalent of a soul. Your software. What happens is somebody gets some alien entity gets control of the internet, and if you click on a certain button, you you're physically dead, and your spirit is now trapped in the internet. 
Is wow. that, the, is that F1 be, escape shift? And it's going to be feasted <laughs> upon by a mind-eating entity. Was Ooh. that the Philip K. Dick episode? <laughs> They may have been inspired by Philip K. Dick for a while. Did you ask yeah. what Philip K. Dick, what, what kind of stories he would have written if he had been alive during the Internet age? Oh, yeah. Wow. I'm sure he'd have a lot of interesting ideas about the current technolo communication technologies. Or would he just be so paranoid he couldn't do anything? Well, that might be, too. Have you read any of his, of his books that... Um, is, is basically they're like notes, uh, is nonfiction where they they printed his notes in a couple of books. Yeah. No. That's some weird shit, man. Dude. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's some weird shit. I can't remember the name of it. No, the twisting realities of Philip K. Dick. That's what. That's one of them. Oh. Okay. It's actually pretty good. So Daniel, have you started the Cisco book yet? Yes, I'm. Uh, the last story I read, I'm all all busy with. I am Providence. Oh, okay. One thousand two hundred sides, but I loved the story. The, the depredation of Moore, that, that was great, and the other story about uh, about Herbert West, where he, where he became this absolute megalomaniac who. Travels in the future, and then he um, wants to watch the universe die, and then he wants to reanimate it. Yeah, that was from yeah. He's That's part of that one round robin. Pretty scary story. Well, I don't think we want to be reading any any more. We don't want to read any more Herbert West stories. No. <laughs> what this is was written uh, almost fifteen years ago. Yes, Rollick was. was Rollick was still a kid. It, there's a sequel of that by C.J. Henderson called The Eternity of Self, which hap which explains what happened to him when he went to the beginning of the universe or the end of the universe. Yeah, because that's all part of that round robin. Actually, all, all all kidding aside, but that, that sounds pretty interesting. I got a lot of things to do. I'm an editor right now. I have to edit two an anthologies. first one will appear, I think, in June, and hopefully in June. The next in... I hope, hopefully, September, October, then I'm writing on a collection of my stories. Uh, it's not really a collection, it's the stories are written for this book. Every story is connected with, with each other, and this is, well, as you heard, I'm busy. Um. Where can I find that story where Herbert West in the beginning of the universe? It actually sounds kind of interesting. Well, the, the, the Cisco Secret Hours. But Cisco's this, collection, Secret Hours. Secret but, Hours? I have that. Secret Hours. I just forgot about it. The, the, the sequel to that is C.J. Henderson's novel, The Eternity of Self. Right. It's all part of that round robin. Above. Well, 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 actually, what, what his part of the round robin involved uh, a connection at the Mountains of Madness that was that was the one that was published in Crypts of Cthulhu. Right. And Henderson wrote a story which ties in not only to Cisco's story but to his own and and that maybe it grew out of the round it grew out of the round robin but it's it wasn't part of the round robin to begin with. Oh, I, all right. I didn't know. I, all right. That's something yeah. I'm unaware of. Then. It's been a really long time since I've read Secret Hours. I'm going to have to pull that back off the shelf and look at that again because I'd forgotten about that. Very funny story in this. Dr. Bondi's Methods. Yeah, it's, that's a great story. I think there's a, some kind of parody. I think it's very funny. Mm -mm. Joe, in that round robin, didn't you have Baron Strucker pop up in a cameo? Yeah. Um, well, McNaughton took it to Germany, so I had to, I had to do something, you know. Um, mostly because and 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 I started writing in my section of that at Bob's because we had spent the afternoon out act shopping for action figures, so. Um, 
and uh, so, some somewhere during the afternoon, when I realized what McNaughton had done, it, and you know, as we were looking at action figures, I just figured, okay, let's see what I can sneak in here. Nobody's ever going to see it to sue me, so you know. <clears throat> Somebody, and I don't remember whether this was you or one of the other writers who had wrote something in Germany in that round robin, brought in uh, boys from Brazil because they had Dr. Mengele doing cloning experiments. Um, that That's where McNaughton started, I thought, in yeah, Germany with Mengele. Um, boy, I... So it's so many years ago. I mean, my God, that's it, at least fifteen years ago. We wrote that thing. I barely remember it. Um, it's a movie, I, I think. No, 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 no. There, there, there's been a few for Herbert West. Um, yeah. What, 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 what McNaughton apparently did was have a tie-in to the movie and novel Boys of Brazil. Yeah. He had Mengele performing the experiments that were later in uh, Ira Levin's novel. Yeah, yeah Mc McNaughton, he was, McNaughton was just a wonder. I mean, uh, he, he was a gem, absolute gem. Talk about somebody I miss. Um, I'll be back in a minute, you guys. Yeah. I figures Pete would have that stuff. I had to, because um, I wanted to be on. You know, I had to find these, and, and I really had to f search them for them, both reanimated and um, resurrected. Because um, I wanted a novel that was true to everything else that had been written before, as I could possibly make it. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, um, I could see that. So. I think you know there there's the, there's a scene where um, in Herbert West reanimated where he West brings back Daniel Kane back to life and I really wanted to, to to work that into the novel so I actually while most of the action in the story in the story that um who was it um I think it was Will Murray. Well, most of what he wrote is off, takes place off screen. I do it right up front. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Interesting that you all use the name Kane, which you, correct me if I'm wrong. That's only from the movie, right? Yeah, it is only from the movie. And you know, it's. I figured it was used in this, yeah. and it is really a different character. Yeah. It's very different. It's still West's partner. But the character, the characterization, the way he acts and, and behaves, uh, is is totally different. I really like that. Somebody ought to collect all that Herbert West stuff. You know, I was thinking about that. There's never been a, you know, for all the work that Chaosium and all these other groups have done, there's never been a, a Herbert West themed anthology. No, there hasn't, and there's a mountain of it that should be collected. You know, yeah. um, Molly did a really great piece. Um, this this stuff, CJ. There's where, where, there for a, for an anthology and, and then to build off of it. Where, oh yeah, where was, where was Molly's story? Lovecraft design. Oh okay. All right, it's called Herbert West in Love. Oh, I've, got, mm. I've got to read this one. Pretty, pretty good, yes. In fact, one of the well, I have a whole story that talks about who's Herbert West's parents are. That's sitting in, um, I think it's going to be published next month. This is interesting. Herbert West seems to be published where? Uh, it's going to be online. Oh, okay. So, as a promo piece for, for the novel. Okay. Uh, if, if that doesn't happen, I'm, I'm probably going to submit it to uh, uh, Jean-Marc. Hey, Pete. And George, um, because uh, the, the character of Herbert West somewhere I had not. This 
book, he says, this is so the mad scientist, and this is a cliche, and this is Dark Knight, yep. and something else, and he's, well, seems to be an interesting character. <laughs> Todd, what were you doing? Yeah, I was going to say, since uh, you can't fly me out to the convention, can you at least sign my copy of Reanimators at Necronomicon? Oh, hell yeah. Thank you. Oh, hell yeah. If, if you're willing to stand in line three <laughs> hours to get up yeah. there, he'll be happy to, you know, scrawl something. You may oh. not be able to read it because he'll probably be drunk. <laughs> you know, but... Pete, just a question. Since you mentioned John Mark, I assume there's some French connection in this. Aaron yes, story. Um, uh, there there is a Moreau connection. Okay, well uh, Moreau is technically East and Wells. You may get. Uh, yeah, but he, yes. Unless you have a different Moreau that I don't know about. No, he, yeah, he is. But you know, Moreau has appeared in in some of the other tales. Right. Well. I think John Mark's strict and that you have to have one character who's pure French. Yep. Well, You'd have to insert somebody into the story. Yeah, I, I think I'm okay. I've got um, Dr. Jekyll, Dr. Moreau, Henry Higgins, and one more person. I can't remember who it is. That oh, guy? um... The, the Professor Challenger analog. Um, I can't Rutherford? Remember. What's that? Ru Rutherford? Yeah, Rutherford. Yeah. The, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to imitate John Mark here. No, 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 it's a French. I, yeah, I know. I'm just, I'm just saying I have to do this. a lot of stories I don't submit to him because I can't work in a French character. Right. No. So, Joe, you have I'm sitting on an excellent shadow pastiche, which may get published somewhere else because they submitted it a, a while ago, but they're going to tell me in August when they get all these stories. And my one problem was I had, like, tons of people, but none of them were French. Yeah. What were you hmm. going to say, Mike? Well, I was going to say, ask Joe, he's got something to tell me that's so secret we need to be off air. Oh, no. About Lawrence, Lawrence Block. No, remember you sent me the book? Yeah, I remember. I haven't got it yet. Well, well, it would be off air for you to tell me that. <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't want to take away from whatever. I just thought I'd let you. I've been, you've been sick. I've been sick, so we haven't talked. Shit, you're right. The view, I'm looking at the viewership right now, and it's, it's dropping like a rock. <laughs> now that you mentioned that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, I'm um, kidding. Well, no, I just you live in Germany. Yeah, That's that doesn't cool. matter. It's been weeks. I just thought you could make a note and check. I mean, you know. Yeah, I suppose I could do that. Yeah. Hey, before I forget, Mike, um, yeah. you were gonna put me into contact with your designer person for these this little project I wanted to do. Oh, you mean Leslie? Yeah. Yeah. Drop uh, her my email and have her contact me, would you? Well, I'll send you you. Okay. I'll send you her email. All right, that's great. Yeah, yeah she's, she's good. I uh, the chat started. I stumbled upon this paragraph in this little book, and it was, I say, this is the saddest paragraph I've ever read in a book. Really. It's uh, Sonia Green, Lovecraft's wife. She um, invited her husband, 1928, back to New York, and then she wrote in her in a memoir late that spring, 1928. I invited Howard to come on a on a visit once more. He gladly accepted, but as a visit only. To me, even that crumb of his nearness was better than nothing. So, unquote. So. Mm -hmm. And then he, he comes back and then he ignores her completely. He stays at her apartment, he eats what she cooks, and he goes out with the boys. He ignores her completely. He <laughs> wrote that one of the saddest things he's ever um, read was when Lovecraft was in New York. He said, um, 
when Lovecraft wrote, and then I began to sell my furniture. Yeah, this this is also yes. He 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 came to hate the city, really. Mm. Great city. You know, he was he was offered editorship of Weird Tales at one point. Would have been interesting. What would have? He didn't want to move to Chicago. Would have been interesting. What would have happened in his life? Yeah. Yeah, that would have that would have definitely changed his life. Yes, but I. Uh, Joshi doubts that this offer was was as serious as it as, as it sounded. It was it was also a serious offering. Mm, well, SD's been known to be wrong. There's um, there's there's two little things that I always thought were were kind of amusing and potential for good stories. One um. Lovecraft apparently lived just a couple blocks from the guy, the woman who wrote um, "Cheaper by the Dozen." <laughs> oh, really? Yes. I didn't know. And um, at one point, um, Theodore Geisel was considering going to Brown. Oh. So, you know, I know that there there is somebody out there who's done you know, you know cover art and and. Uh, Dr. Seuss's Cthulhu, but a, a story along that line where Lovecraft and, and Geisel work together would be kind of interesting. Hmm. At least in my feeble mind. <clears throat> That'd be different. Be pretty tough, though. I wonder what the estate would think about that. Yeah. You know? Hmm. Well, I think I'm gonna go watch a movie or something. Okay. Yeah, I think I I gotta go put my kids to bed. And I think I'm going to bed. It's two o'clock in the morning. Oh. Yep. Well, thanks for being here, guys. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Good night. Let me know what you find out about that block book.